Okay, well, welcome to, a very warm welcome to the Natural, Nature Positive Pavilion this afternoon, everybody. It's good to see you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, as you may know, the, the pavilion is um, coordinated by the Nature uh, for Climate Coalition, of which, of course, the Smithsonian Institute is a member, and we're very pleased that, that is indeed the case. Uh, I don't think there is any particular housekeeping issues to manage, but so I, at that point I will hand directly over to your mo moderator for the day, or the afternoon I should say, Dr. Ellen Stofan, who's the Under Secretary for Science at the Smithsonian Institute. Ellen. Thank you. If our panelists could come up, that would be great. Panelists come up. Excellent. Um, I think we're missing one, aren't we? Yeah. Yep. We're just going to hope they show up. Okay. All right. Welcome to our panel today on From Ground to Space, the Future of Forest Carbon. For over 175 years, the Smithsonian has been doing science for scientists, increasing and diffusing knowledge. There's no better example of that than Forest Geo, a global network of forest plots where intense ground measurements have allowed us to understand forests in deep ways, but have also served as invaluable monitoring sites for climate change. But now we need science for impact, for solutions, which is why the Smithsonian launched Life on a Sustain Sustainable Planet at COP last year which is all about providing nature-based solutions where people and nature come together. From blue carbon in coastal ecosystems to restoring species with indigenous people on indigenous lands to working with communities on resilient solutions. We also see, see a huge need to underpin financial solutions, things like carbon credits and the coming biodiversity credits. We need to underpin these financial solutions with sound, validated science. By combining Forest Geo with other forest networks, we have launched GeoTrees, and our panelists are going to explain what that is and why it's critically important. Our panelists today are Dr. Stuart Davies, the Director of Forest Geo and the Frank H. Levinson Chair, a senior staff scientist at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute. Dr. Christiane Samper, who used to be part of the Smithsonian, but who is now the managing director and leader of Nature Solutions at the Bezos Earth Fund. Adriani Escaval Mulbert from the University of Birmingham. Craig Hansen, the managing director of the World Resource Institute. And Frank Martin Seifert from the European, the European Space Agency. I'm going to start, Stuart, with you. Can you provide us with an overview of GeoTrees, how it came about, who's involved, what is the need, and why is it important? Small okay. question. Yep. Great. Thanks very much, Ellen, and thanks to the panelists for joining us today. As you all know, uh, forests are a, really a crucial potential mechanism for mitigating carbon emissions uh, globally. They account for something like three quarters of total carbon stored on the terrestrial surface of the Earth, and they're taking up roughly a quarter of the emissions of the global carbon emissions, that, uh, anthropogenic global carbon emissions. However, forests are a huge risk from a mitigation point of view because they suffer damage through storms, and, and those storms and fires and other disturbance mechanisms seem to be increasing their rates globally. The risk could be somewhat reduced if we can map and monitor and measure carbon and biomass at a global scale much more rapidly and much more precisely. The Earth Observation Community, Frank Martin's representing that, the Earth Observation Community has been investing enormous amounts of resources into building instruments that sit up in space, either on the space station or as satellites, to map and monitor biomass on Earth. The fundamental problem with that system is that we don't have a global, independent, transparent system for calibrating and validating those observations from space. That's an incredibly important piece of developing a strategy for using forests as a mitigation mechanism. 
in parallel to the, the Earth observation community building these satellites, the ground-based community of forest ecologists globally have been building thousands of plots to monitor the dynamics and the diversity and the biomass of forests. These plots have been managed in the tropics by people like Adriani, who are, are monitoring these forests for diversity and for the long term. A few years ago, the Earth observation community and the ground ecological community got together and said, hey, we need to solve this problem, this Cal CalVal problem, by partnering. And so we got together and said, the, the uh, one way we can do this is, the first thing we need to do is build a set of protocols or standards that can be used globally. And so under the, the Community on Earth Observation Satellites and following IPCC protocols, we built a set of, of standard protocols that could be used as a CalVal system. So the next thing we did was then we, we got together and formed this GeoTrees idea, a partnership, as Ellen said, between the Earth Observation Community and the many, many partners in, in, on the ground across the world's forests who are mapping and monitoring forests. We then, um, working together, we've established this GeoTrees idea. We built the protocols around fundamental ground-based plot measurements, terrestrial laser scanning, which builds a very fine scale uh, carbon inventory of a site, and scaling that up with airborne laser scanning to build, build a, a regional and ultimately global maps partnering with the Earth observation instruments. The way this can succeed, it needs to benefit both sides. It needs to benefit the Earth observation community, which it does very effectively because the fundamental principle of GeoTrees is that the data become publicly available. It's a public good. Anyone who's interested in biomass patterns and dynamics can access this information but it also needs to benefit the ground communities. It needs to benefit all the networks of plots who have been established in the tropics, particularly over the last several decades. And the way we're doing that in GeoTrees is to build equity into the sampling and measurement and monitoring of these forests. So with training and capacity building and technology transfer built into the GeoTrees initiative, we believe we can build an, uh, the first, the world's really the world's first CalVal system for Earth observations of biomass. The great news, and Christian's representing the Bezos Earth Fund, the great news is that the Bezos Earth Fund came out earlier this year and gave us a, an enormous grant to kickstart this initiative. Our, our plan, we think, our plan is to build 100 of the core geotree sites around the world's forests, representing all the different kinds of forests that exist. And geotrees uh, is being supported by the Bezos Earth Fund too established the first 30 of these sites. We're also partnering through CNRS in France, the um, other groups, the Smithsonian, University of Leeds, and other institutions to help support other additional sites. So we believe in a you know, five to eight year time scale, we can make a huge impact by building this GeoTrees in initiative. I'll finish there and um, pass it back to Ellen. Okay, thank you, Stuart. Christian, can you describe what this project means for the Bezos Earth Fund and why you thought it was a priority for support? How do you think this gift can leverage other resources to complete the mission of creating a truly global forest biomass reference system? Thanks, Ellen, and thanks, Stuart. Um, the Bezos Earth Fund is a new kid on the block. We're less than three years old, but we're all about nature and climate solutions. And we have to recognize that these are two sides of the same coin. They have to be looked at together. And it's not only about carbon. It's about carbon. It's about biodiversity. It's about the people that are there. Um, so we've, we've started really uh, deploying some investments here. And clearly, one of the key questions is, as you were describing, Stuart, right now, is sort of really understanding the biomass and the flux and the dynamics in some of these forests and how they're changing over time. And this is absolutely key. The, the beautiful thing is that we have, over decades, built a community. And some of these plots, and full disclosure, I actually set up one of those plots 25 years ago. So I sweated it, and I know it, and I've seen it uh, from even before I joined the Smithsonian. But what caught our eye about this uh, proposal were several things. One, it was the fact that it really tried to bring together these various people. We, we, we like to identify initiatives and coalitions of players. We don't want just one. We'd like to be able to bring together groups, and that's what GeoTrees does. It brings together various efforts around a goal that's bigger than any one organization. 
Uh, I think that was something really, really important. Second was some of the technologies that we could look at here, including when we visited you in Panama, we had a chance to look at some of the ground-based um, LiDAR systems that could be used and really looking at this. So how can we combine the remote sensing tools with some of the on-the-ground measurements that we could do and really refine a lot more some of these estimates? We still want to see what we do with the below-ground biomass. That's still a, a bit of an unknown and it's probably more important than we think. And we can't do that from space yet, I think, but maybe you'll correct me. But we're very interested about those issues. So that was the second issue. And we feel that all the debate that there is around carbon markets and high integrity markets and everything, one of the reasons, and we've all been monitoring some of the skeptics, one of the reasons this is not really taking off is because we don't have good data to be able to monitor this. And we need to do it in a way at the right temporal and spatial resolution that we can really do this. The investors want to know what, how much is there? How is the planet changing? So one of the other investments that we're doing is in something called the Land and Carbon Lab with the World Resources Institute, and you'll probably talk about it. But it's very much around this idea of building on the experience of Global Forest Watch, expanding it to other kinds of ecosystems, and giving us that resolution that we need to monitor the changes. And Craig will probably talk about this. So uh, we felt it was the right time to do it. We're very pleased to be the initial donor and the leader for this. And I think this is a moment to build a coalition of donors as well. The various uh, people involved, interested in this, governments, private sector, philanthropy and others, to really be able to get from 30 to 100, because we're gonna need that kind of a sample size to really understand this. Sometimes we extrapolate from three sites. I mean, I remember the first BCI site that was set up 40 years ago. That's one site, but even right next door in the Chocó of Colombia, that's a very different kind of forest. So you really need to replicate this to understand the dynamics of these places. So we're very happy to collaborate on this and uh, look forward to seeing uh, what we can do and uh, working together. Thank you. Adriani, can you describe the role of scientists and research communities within the tropics in this initiative and how this initiative will benefit tropical forest countries and what is going to be required to ensure their long-term engagement? Thank you. Um, I would like to start answering this question with a sentence that I, I heard a few days ago from Roy Gonzalez in Instituto Humboldt that bosques no son solo bosques, bosques también son gente. Forests are not just forests, forests are people. And forests are the people who depend on these forests for their livelihoods, depend on these forests for clean water, but also the research communities that uh, work on these forests and are extremely connected to this forest. So below the canopy that we see from space and inside within that carbon, uh, that we have in forest. We also have uh, outdoor labs uh, across the tropics, and these are the sites, the, the GO3 sites. Um, and this community of researchers across the tropics, they have the curiosity to understand forests, they love to protect this forest, and uh, I believe they, they, they have the potential to be the future of, of tropical ecology. Um, and and this, this curiosity of scientists uh, from tropical countries uh, have been, uh, that have been spending a lot of time monitoring this forest, uh, many years in, terms of in, in times of economical instability, they kept monitoring this forest over time. And one example is um, Beatriz Marimon, Professor Beatriz Marimon from Mato Grosso, who uh, has um, spent 30 years of her life measuring trees and understanding the transition between the Amazon and the savanna. And these data are the data that now allow us to understand why uh, Amazonian forests and how Amazonian forests are responding to drought. Um, so they, they're also the, the love that and the connection then that tropical researchers have for the environment and, and and that we, the environment that we grow up and the environment that we are connected to, that allow us to then create policies and, and work with policymakers to, to create policies that will protect this forest. So we all know now that it's extremely challenging to work in the interface between science and policy, but it's possible with strong connections and long-term connections between the people from these tropical countries, the scientists from tropical countries, and the, and, and the policymakers there. So I just came back from Instituto Humboldt, where they are actually using forest geosites for, and, and other sites to uh, create policy and to work with, with policymakers in Colombia. 
And, and these outdoor labs, they have trained uh, hundreds of researchers, researchers from tropical countries like myself and Christian, um, but they have trained researchers from elsewhere like Stuart, Simon Lewis, who is here as well. And these, these places, they have, uh, they, they have an enormous value in training people and being the future of, uh, of, of, of forest research in the tropics. Um, so I, I believe uh, GeoTrees is uh, an amazing opportunity to continue to, fo to fund these this, uh, outdoor labs long term so that they continue to stimulate the curiosity, the love that, that, makes, uh, that, that, that makes these people want to protect this forest and, and, and protect these environments so, and the people that depend on these environments over time. Thank you. Craig. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> um, how does the kind of data that GeoTrees is collecting, how does that help advance what WRI is trying to do through things like Global Forest Watch, Land and Carbon Lab, and, and why do you think this is important for ensuring sustainable development and tackling some of the major challenges that we face due to climate change? Great, thank you, and thanks for inviting me. And sorry I'm late. I heard my name called as I was just walking by. Oh, this is where it's at. As I run from a presentation in the green zone, you all know what it's like, right? So, uh, anyway, pleasure to be here. I'm Craig Hansen, Managing Director of Programs at WRI. Um, this is super important. We're glad to be supporting and engaged with GeoTrees and all the partners on this here. You may know of us in t on this space in terms of Global Forest Watch. It was a decade ago that we launched Global Forest Watch, first ever. You have a chance to about monitor what's happening on every single forest across the planet. Um, we've more recently, as, as, as Christiane has mentioned, uh, have, 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 uh, are partnering with the Basis Growth Fund with the Land and Carbon Lab. So Deborah and Basis Growth Fund's Land and Carbon Lab basically is now monitoring every single inch of the planet, not just forests, but it's grasslands, it's croplands, it's wetlands, it's urban areas, everything. Every, if it's terrestrial, we can see it. We're using four to five different types of satellites, being able to monitor what's going on. That's really cool, right? Because you can actually monitor and see now, we, we, can, we can detect when, when there's clearance of, say, Sahado, right? Which was harder to do in Global Forest Watch. But if, once the tree density gets a little bit too low, you can't see grassland conversion, but now we can. Right, and that's couldn't you couldn't be do that two years ago, right? So now we're really excited about all, and we now we can actually see. I see Dennis Garrity, an old friend and partner here in front. We can see individual trees coming back up again, thanks to the generosity of the Bezos Earth Fund, the Bezos Earth Fund, Debray Land and Carbon Lab. We have invented using an algorithm that was first used in Teslas, right? We've applied it to action and used in, in finding in, and also in hospitals for detecting cancer cells in human beings. We've applied that same technology to see individual trees growing, coming back, whether in the Sahel or somewhere else. Again, something that couldn't have been done before. And so again, thank you, Christian, for believing in us and this partnership we've got with you on um, being able to do this. But that's watching the land change for good or for ill. But there's a lot of interest in carbon. In fact, this, our second name is Land and Carbon Lab, right? So how do you do that, right? You can, you, can get, you can get part of the infrastructure of it all by looking from space. Where, where's the vegetation, how tall it is, how dense it is, et cetera. But that doesn't get you to actually the actual carbon content. You need ground calibration. You need that data. And as, as Christian, as you mentioned earlier, in the past, you had a few plots here and there, then we would just extrapolate. You know, two sites in, in, in part of the Amazon, and then that was all of Brazil, right? But we all know ecosystems, you drive 10, 15 kilometers, and ecosystem is a different ecosystem, right? So getting that diversity across the planet, that representation, is really fundamental if we want to actually fully and accurately reflect the carbon that is embedded, being lost, or coming back into these ecosystems, right? And Ultimately, being able to help countries meet their NDCs, help markets actually function by giving them the credibility that currently is, is missing at times. So we're really excited about this. This is exactly what's needed. It may not make the New York Times headlines, you know, kind of sexy stuff, but you're in there in the forest gathering this data. It is the fundamental homework that needs to be done to make all this work. Frank, um, can you describe the European Space Agency's role in this initiative? and sort of provide a perspective from the Earth observation community on the importance of ground truth like geotrees and describe maybe some future directions or applications for this kind of initiative. 
Well, <clears throat> thanks for giving me the floor. Uh, what we just heard from uh, related to WRI uh, Global Forest Watch, we as a space agency, together with many other space agencies coordinated by CEOs, we are providing the data that enabling you to do uh, that. ESA, European Space Agency, an intergovernmental organization of 22 European uh, states, uh, is within forest monitoring since decades. We, we were starting in the 80s uh, with US-based uh, uh, built satellites, Landsat. Uh, then we're coming up in the 90s with ERS, a radar satellite, Envisat in the 2000s. And now with the Sentinels, a European system for observing the globe, uh, which we built up with the European Commission, we are providing 300 terabytes of data each day to understand better, not only the forest, but the overall environment, livelihood, and finally as well, climate change. Coming, coming now back towards the forest, we have been engaged with uh, another geo, uh, flagship, GFOI, or its precursor, uh, uh, forest carbon tracking, since uh, the uh, late 2000s. We are a lead of GFOI, and assist with, which is a sister organization, let's say, or sister uh, uh, activity within GEO, uh, related to GEO trees. We have been uh, involved uh, since uh, in RED Plus, how it's called nowadays, since the Montreal, uh, uh, Montreal uh, uh, COP in 2005 coming up with countries building what is possible to support the countries in monitoring their forests. This morning, I was at an event at the Gabonese uh, Pavillon, and they showed what we started together with them 15 years ago, how they were building up uh, uh, the knowledge on forest, on, on their forest within, with a national forest observation system, uh, getting into details on mangroves, getting into all their national needs uh, based on activities which we uh, were starting together with them uh, yeah, 15 years ago to, uh, uh, to get a grip on what is happening within the countries. I learned from these corporations that it's important to combine communities. Combine communities on the ground, people are doing measurements, people are living there, uh, people who are uh, taking active ownership of the forest. Forest, as you rightly said, it's not just the trees, it is livelihood, it is biodiversity, uh, it is uh, the source of income for many, many peoples. people. It's where uh, many, many animals are living, it's a resource for, uh, uh, for our Health. How many uh, pharmaceutical instrument, uh, pharmaceutical uh, uh, substances are coming out of forests? Forests are an essential part of our planet, and we have to protect it. Now, coming towards uh, our engagement with in Geo Trees, ESA has been a founding member as well of Geo Trees, and. For us as a space agency, one thing is clearly what you said before. We want to do calibration and validation of our space data. But we see as well uh, forests in a very panoptical view. The ground-based data to combined with airborne data, combined then with uh, the satellite data. This gives a complete overview. And as you rightly said, the, uh, the sum is much bigger, uh, the, uh, the overall, uh, what we can achieve together is much bigger what anybody of us can achieve alone. And that's why we are in GeoTrees. It is about uh, bringing the knowledge, and there we're coming out to, uh, towards, carb uh, towards climate change and uh, the important component of uh, for us to store carbon, understanding above ground biomass, and yes, you're right, we cannot measure from space below ground biomass, 
we are estimating it uh, based on the relation uh, with uh, above ground biomass. Uh, the carbon uh, content, to get a better understanding of it, to provide ecologists, to provide uh, uh, the uh, climate science with more accurate numbers on how much carbon is stored in the forest, how much more do we need. That is why we are uh, into uh, geotrees. Forests alone will not save our planet, but without uh, forests, the planet cannot be saved. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Stuart, I'll, I'll start with you and then anyone else can chime in. I mean, 100 sites sounds like a lot, but forests obviously cover 30% of land surface. So how do you ensure that you're gathering enough calibration and validation data to, to do the job? Yeah, that's a good question. The, um, our approach to this was to take a large amount of data that we already have from the ground plot data uh, and then take all the bio, oh, some of the biophysical variables that drive where forests occur, so rainfall, temperature, and so on, and then, and then build a sort of a model to try to get as maximize the representativeness of the distribution of these 100 sites. And, and by doing that, we, I think we get a pretty good estimate of the majority of forests globally. However, there's many forests um, that we're not going to be able to represent in the initial phase of this. But, but our view is that in initially we'll set up these 100 core sites. They'll be complemented by a whole series of smaller supplementary sites that will identify you know, particular sites of unique geology or unique rainfall distribution or whatever. And together that will, I think, provide a full coverage of what we, what we need. Frank Martin, I don't know if you want to, if you want to Combine with that at all, that answer that question about how you think about calibration and validation of your data for forest. Well, what you just mentioned, the 100 sites, and we hope that it will, will, be, uh, will become more and more, uh, they brought together with the other data, that will give us uh, the additional step of no, uh, uh, advance in knowledge uh, and on uh, how to uh, how much carbon will be is stored and how to protect forest uh, in general. Related uh, related to Calval, yes, we are uh, using uh, local uh, information uh, distributed on many spots over the uh, over the globe, and the biggest uh, uh, the biggest gap we have is in tropical forests. Dense tropical forests are very uh, difficult. Uh, to assess related to biomass. Uh, with our sensors, we often get into saturation of, uh, uh, if you're looking at uh, uh, Gabon or the, uh, in the dense Amazon uh, with uh, more than up to thousands of tons per hectare, uh, we will not get a good estimate. But together with the ground uh, observations, uh, we, will, uh, we will calibrate uh, our uh, algorithms uh, to retrieve uh, better uh, the uh, overall stored uh, uh, carbon in the forest. Uh, next year, end of next year, we will launch the first P-band uh, satellite called Biomass, who, uh, uh, which is a microwave satellite. And sorry to get into a little bit of technique. It can pen it doesn't see only the canopy. It goes through the canopy and uh, gets uh, uh, gets a better estimate of uh, the uh, stored biomass also in denser uh, forest. So we are looking forward to the launch of this one to contribute additionally to all the things what we're doing within GeoTrees and all the other and uh, GFOI and other initiatives. Uh, to get a better grip of, uh, of the carbon uh, stored in forest. Huge fan of P-band. I didn't know about that. That's really exciting. Um, <laughs> um, is there, Stuart, back to you on this. Is there an opportunity for external independent sites to join in the GeoTrees initiative? 
Absolutely. Uh, um, as I said in earlier, that we developed a set of standard protocols following IPCC guidelines that anyone can really, that, that's a publicly available document. Um, or, as I said, all the data arising from the GeoTrees initiative will be a public good. It'll be accessible and available. Um, and, and so any sites, in fact, I've already been at this meeting, already been discussing with, with additional countries um, the opportunity to use their sites as potential GeoTree sites, self-funded or otherwise funded. Um, um, so yes, absolutely. The, the, the more the merrier at some, at some level. Excellent. Um, and, and to follow on a bit with that with you, Christian, I know it was really important to the Bezos Earth Fund to ensure that some of the, a good part of the funding you were providing was actually going back to the countries where the work is being done, for the work being done, to, to make sure there's that local investment and that local capacity building in exchange. Yeah, absolutely. And <clears throat> I mean, that's a key issue because these plots have to be run by and managed by people in those countries' institutions. And the plot I mentioned was with the Humboldt Institute, actually, which I was the founding director of Humboldt many years ago. So it was really interesting. But it's having a plot like that managed by someone like Humboldt, or having a plot in Mato Grosso owned by there, or in Congo, Building that capacity at the country level is key. And yes, one of the things we are interested in is we want to make sure that our funding doesn't just stay in the broader network or the Smithsonian, that it's really reaching the ground and building that capacity longer term, which is key. Um, Adriani, how do you think about that, that critical issue of capacity building in exchange with the work that you're doing in science? Yeah, I think these are two key points. The, the capacity building of continuing what's going on and continuing the long-term uh, monitoring because actually the continuation and, and the long-term of, uh, long of these data sets are their key, their, their key asset, but also this exchange and then really bringing the understanding of these technologies that we have now uh, to tropical countries and, and, and empowering the researchers there to be able to use these tools and to be able to then uh, being uh, designing the research and, and leading the, this global research because we want uh, global research to be led by, especially tropical research, to be led by, by those from, from the tropics, ideally. Mm -hmm. One of the things, sorry. One of the things that we did, which was important many years ago, so you remember, was bringing together a science. It's not only about the technology to gather the data or managing the data. It's about analyzing the data. That's a really key issue. So we'd bring the people together and we'd really say, train them and look at the tools. We'd sort of say, we're going to do a two-week workshop. Come with your data and we will analyze it together and we will compare it across plots and issues. That ability to provide capacity to, to work with the users, not to do the analysis for them, but to train them to do the analysis and to see results there. That's how we get insights that are bigger than any one site or any one place. I can, only, I can only subscribe to this. Uh, it is not about somebody from uh, the uh, Western world producing some information and giving it uh, uh, to developing countries. It's about cooperation. And one thing what I learned in this cooperation is it is a bi uh, bi-directional street. The information flows in both directions. And only uh, with this flow in both directions we really gain another and a different level of information and knowledge. So that's a really critical point. The people who live in those forests know way more about them than we do. Um, and making sure that we're incorporating that knowledge is really critical. Craig, for you, when you when you think about Land and Carbon Lab, and when you think, all right, you know, we're producing data. You guys are providing a platform for it that we think can help really. Um, provide the validation of carbon data that's really needed, I think, in many of our opinions to sort of underpin a carbon market. If you build it, will they come? So how do we ensure that this, these data are being taken up and used, you know, to their full extent? Yeah, is, yeah, great, great question. And a lot of what we just talked about today is stuff that's under the hood, so to speak, right? I mean, the end users, whether you're a policymaker, a company, um, a trader, you name it, right, and even NGO, an activist NGO, uh, they just want the data. They want it 
easily accessible, they want it easily understandable, and they want to know that they can trust it without having to do tons of research themselves, right? And so one thing that helps do that is the collaboration, right, and the and entities that are part of any type of collaboration. But uh, I just want to emphasize all this stuff that we, all the, the stuff that's going to happen with the geotrees is really the hard homework that needs to be done that's under the hood that, no, that, that the rest of the world doesn't really see and they take for granted, right? And, and I think the, the folks here on this panel recognize that, that that's a lot of what's needed. But then to your point about the external world, um, once it is delivered to them, I think one hand you gotta make it available. You can't just rely on a throw it over the fence and hopefully they come, right? Because no, you, you have to engage your target audiences almost from the get-go so that you design what type of data you're gathering, you design how it's delivered, right, uh, to them up front, right? So whether it is carbon marketeers, financial institutions, companies, et cetera, we at NBRI spend a lot of our time engaging those communities up front, even while we're waiting for the data to come, because we know that we have to be a little bit of the, we like to see ourselves as in between the, the um, <coughs> the frontiers of the, of the innovation and the front lines of the implementation. And those two communities typically don't speak together, right? So one thing we spend our time doing is trying to be the bridge. We know enough of both sides to be dangerous, right? But hopefully both sides to be able to be that, be that bridge for it. You know, and I, I guess in the long run and in a bit, this is both for you and for Christian. I mean, the philanthropic world right now a little bit of government money, philanthropic support is what's allowing us to conduct this science to provide this calibration and validation data. Huge investment by governments into the satellites that are really, we couldn't do this without those satellites and that government investment. But in long run, if there's value in these markets, how do we ensure that some of that value goes back to this issue? It has to be underpinned by valid data. I think um, if we're able to create a, if a market emerges, right, that's leveraging this type of information, then there, then there must be a way to actually find some way to extract a little bit of that value to then go to help finance the ongoing supply of, of, of that data, right? That happens in the private sector all the time. The risk is that a lot of times, at least when you're starting up, the private sector sees all this as a public good. And, and sees that governments and our philanthropists are paying for it, it's that transition period is tricky. Because they're saying, well, why should I start not paying for it now? Because the past 10 years I've had this data for free, so what, what's up, right? It, it, the transition, I think, is critical. And I think that's where we have to be thinking now, five to 10 years ahead, of what might these markets or, or ways of value creation, how's it gonna emerge? Then how do you start now laying the seeds for how you actually create that value. I mean, one just one classic example of, in our experience is Global Forest Watch. Global Forest Watch has been a public good for 10 years, right? We actually, though, but we know that a lot of private sector uses Global Forest Watch for their supply chain commitments. And so we actually have something called GFW Pro. And what we can do there is actually charge a fee to corporate users because we provide a little bit of additional value and functionality that they need, right? The, the rest of the world doesn't need it, but they need it. You know, the, a secret, a, a, a confidential place they can overlay their supply data to then analyze and do what they do to, to manage their supply chains. Well, that functionality is a value proposition, and, then we, and, and they should pay for it, right? The Norwegian government, based on their fund, shouldn't pay for that. That company should pay for that extra functionality. So being creative and thinking along those ways, I think, is important. Christian, I'd, I'd love to hear your perspective because you must be dealing with this every minute of every day, right? Because the Bezos Earth Fund, while it, it has an awful lot of money, it's nowhere near the amount of money that's actually needed to actually keep these things going and, and do all the good that's needed. So how do you think about how you leverage your investment um, in that sense? Well, one of the key questions that we always ask ourselves is, um, would this happen without us? Um, it's, a, it's a classic question because we are interested in doing those places where we can move fast, take risks that others won't do. Quite often what we do is that first mover because we know it may take seven years to get the funding if you're going for a certain multilateral agency funding or something like that. And we can move in three weeks if we need to to do it. So I think it's figure out where we do it. But the other thing is the Bezos Earth Fund is designed to be spent down by 2030. We're not going to be here. We're not a foundation. We're not a long-term issue. So we feel that we're front-loading this and saying this is the decade where we're going to make the investments. 
but we want to make sure every time we do it, we figure out the longer term sustainability of these efforts. I mean, some of them may be one time investments, some of them we're building different kinds of finance mechanisms. I do think in the case of restoration in particular, uh, the possibility of moving private capital into that, something interesting, something we're working with WRI, is there's a lot of capital that's ready to move into the space, and it's not moving because the data and the systems are not there to be able to, to really be able to monitor this. So I think it's gonna be a very interesting, that's a place where we think our investment right now can solve those bottlenecks and move fast and get the conditions ready to allow for this to happen. Stuart, um, could you let people know a little bit more about why GeoTrees sort of is, is forced geo on, on steroids in terms of the fact that you're bringing in degraded forests, you're bringing in regrowing forests, and why the ongoing monitoring, this isn't just, oh, we validated the data, we're done, we can go now. Why yeah. is the ongoing work so important? It, two, point, two points. One, one is... Um, it's n this is not only about valuing carbon. This is, you know, forests are changing dramatically. And there's still a lot of argument in the scientific liter literature to the degree to which forests are going to continue to be a sink or, or they're going to switch over and start to be a source. And so one of the things we're sort of designing within GeoTrees, and because of this extensive set of partner networks and partner sites we're working with to establish GeoTrees, we have long-term baseline data on what these forests have been doing. And so going forward, in addition to valuing stocks, we're very obviously critically interested in what the fluxes are gonna look like. And, and to get at those fluxes, we're modeling those. And the, the whole modeling community is another great user group of these, these kind of data, is asking the questions about what's gonna happen to, to the global forest carbon stock and, and as we drive climate, as we drive land use changes. And so to get at that, we have to do, uh, the second point was we have to sample not just mature forests. Mature, mature forests are critical, they're a critical stock, but they're only about a third of the entire l remaining tropical forest left on the planet. The other two thirds have either been degraded or they're now secondary, cleared and re recovering. And so the design of geotrees is to cover all three of those kinds of forests across the biogeography where forests occur. And to put you on the spot a little bit, could we do this kind of system? You know, we've been talking a lot about carbon and carbon credits. Now we're hearing about biodiversity yeah. credits. Could we do this kind of system for biodiversity? I mean, this goes back to the, the plot networks that Adriani mentioned. You know, the, the people on the ground who've established these plots over decades have, spent, have literally spent decades identifying every single tree species that's in these plots. The collaboration we have among the ground networks involves about 10,000 plots across the entire tropics. That, they, those 10,000 plots account for probably about 75% of all tree species on Earth. This is an extraordinary thing. And so if we are moving in the direction of trying to track biodiversity change, this is the way we should do it. This is the, where I'm hoping, personally hoping, that this, is, this, this GeoTrees idea is actually going to be a model with which we can, as the, satellite, as the space agency technologies develop to be able to monitor biodiversity from space, we'll be in a position on the ground to have that CalVal system for a, a true global biodiversity monitoring system. Excellent. I'm going to bring in Josh Tewksbury, the director of the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute, who is our discussant today. So Josh, if you could give us a bit of a summary, and then I'd love to know if you have any questions for the panel. Sure, sure. And um, thanks so much. This has been such an exciting panel. So before I, uh, before I moved to Panama to lead the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute, I lived in Boulder. And right across my fence was the National Institute of Standards and Technology, and I used to joke with my kids that their job was to measure the official inch. But it turns out that that work is critical. It's called metrology. It's the science of measurement. And fundamentally, when you go into a grocery store, you don't worry about which scale to use because of that measurement, right? We don't have that level of capacity in forests right now. We can't measure where carbon is the way we can create trust when you go to a grocery store because we haven't done this fundamental CalVal work that GeoTrees is setting out to do. It's kind of the fundamental 
closing the loop on what the Earth Observation Community has been doing to start to see forests, to understand them so that we can de-risk marketplaces in real time all over the world in every forest type. And so what I heard was a lot of enthusiasm for communities coming together. I heard, uh, I heard to me, this is about how science works across communities, ge geographies, also ways of creating knowledge from, from local knowledge to global knowledge, ways of observing the Earth, and then also how to create value from that science in real time. And to me, that's really exciting. It's a sort of the way in which science has to move into the future in which we're saying, what is the problem? And to me, one of the most exciting things about GeoTrees is it wasn't people going, I've got an idea. It was, I've got a need. The world has a need. How do we solve this problem? And then a bunch of really smart people saying, wait, I've got a piece of that problem right here. It just hasn't been put to use this way. We've been measuring forests for 40 years. We thought we were measuring biodiversity. We're actually measuring carbon. And then you've got communities in space saying, we've got a problem. We have the best systems in the world to measure the world's forests, but they don't measure the carbon because they can't see it. How do you get those communities together? And then philanthropists and others coming in and saying, right, we can do that. That's, that's doable, that's, that's, that's something we can start so others can follow because we can't do it alone and we can't do it fast enough. And then folks like, so folks like WRI is like, well, we've been mapping this for, for a long time. We've been building the capacity to visualize these things in, for the world and we can see the value in the communities from corporations to NGOs to use that work. That's critical because it doesn't matter if we create or if we can't, if we can't speak to the world with that knowledge. And so this community to me is, this is what, is exciting about, I think, where science is going in a place like Nature Positive, in a place where we're seeing the future of communities coming together for a better and more sustainable planet. So um, I guess, I, I, don't, I don't know if I have enough time for any questions for the panel. I do, okay. So first of all, I would like to thank all the panelists, but wait, I'm gonna let Christian take off because he has another uh, engagement at, uh, all the way on the other side of the pavilion. Yeah, and, and so you can, you can scoot at this point. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Christian. Um, so, I, I guess I, I would like to follow up a little bit with the panelists here about, about like, I want, to, I want us to sort of think a little bit big around a couple of pieces, right? So, um, with, with Chris Yan leaving, we can, we can talk about him behind his back, but we can also talk about the need for collaborative funding, right? The need for sort of thinking broadly about funding mechanisms, because I, I think, and he posed this question as well, like, how do we build a funding collaborative? Because one of the things about GeoTrees that is unresolved is, we have to get to that product. We have to, we have to actually show, we have to, we have to create that product now because the carbon markets are not, are, are a risky space right now. And one part of it is because we don't know the answer of where carbon is. So I just love ideas from the panelists around how different ways that you guys have been thinking about moving this process forward um, in terms of thinking about how to get to a product, not just the measurement of this, within five years, within six years, within the time frame that people need that product to make decisions on for us? That's an open question. Oh, I was pointing to you. <laughs> well, from my point of view, uh, we have to, uh, similar as for GeoTrees, it's bringing together people who have a need. And uh, the carbon market you have regulators, you have the financial institutions, you have the uh, observers, you have the people uh, who are developing projects, you have the people who are living in this area where projects develop. You have to bring those together to see where needs are matching and to uh, get to a common language and work together that at the end it's not only one part who is taking all the benefit, but the benefit is distributed amongst all. And I'm thinking very much about the people living in this area where the car carbon is sequestrated. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. So uh, it is, as we started with GeoTrees, as we started with Copernicus, it's about a need where people try to, they're organizing themselves around a need and trying to solve it. It's the same, it's a very similar thing related to the carbon market from my right, point of view. Right, that's great. Anyone else? I also think it's um, every organization has a role to play. If, yeah. if, if, you, if you see the bigger picture, if everyone can agree on what the end game is, then you know, the governments or the satellites know what they're doing, right? The folks who are 
managing, identifying and managing the plot measurements, know what they're doing. Folks like us who are really good at visualization and translating complex science into usable tools, by the, we know what role that we play, right? And I think the more that we talk and we're engaged in, in, in a collaborative type of initiative, each player kind of sees its role and, 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 and what, it can, what it can bring to the game. That's great, that's great. I, I, I wanted, to, just wanted to ask one other question. One of the, Ellen asked a question about biodiversity. And I also wanted to just sort of, sort of ask a question about where we see the scope of this, right? So like, what's a mangrove to this community? Is a mangrove a forest? And is the, are, we, are, are mangroves included in, in, our, in, in, this, in this observation? Absolutely. Why? Why wouldn't uh, all all forests are included in this initiative? So, peat swamp forests, major source of car of stocks of carbon, both in the Congo and in mainly Southeast Asia. Mangroves, very small area, but a very important carbon stock, um, would be included in this initiative for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, that's great. That's great to hear. Well, related to IPCC guidelines. Mangroves can be uh, put into the wetlands, but can be as well put into the forest. It's about the country to decide where they're putting them uh, on their accounting. Nevertheless, wherever they are in the, uh, in the accounting, they are a carbon-rich ecosystem, an ecosystem which is extremely important, as well as coastal pr uh, uh, protection, for uh, as breeding ground for, uh, for fish and other animals. Uh, it is uh, 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 against uh, erosion of the coastline, uh, protects from, uh, uh, from, uh, uh, from storms and so on. Uh, we have to take care of mangroves. If they are wetlands or if they are classified as forest, that's on paper. Right. So, Let's, let's take care of our mangroves. I just want to connect the carbon and biodiversity questions here because we talk about them separately often, but actually the carbon is very dependent on which species are there and how they are distributed. And also the, the maintenance of the carbon there, so the resilience of these forests is also very depending on their biodiversity too. So I think we have to think about these two things together and not separately. And, and definitely the next step should be biodiversity if you want to see the future of these forests. But I'm, I'm gonna ask a question though back to my fellow panelists because I presume this is a question for many people in the audience it's also a question in my head, right? It's one thing to use remote sensing and see trees and forests. It's another thing to do plot samples, which is then you know, get, get, get the field data. You can calibrate against your remote sensing of trees, height, density, et cetera. That I can get. There's a mathematical equation for that one, right? But biodiversity, I'm looking at that forest across the way right here, right? <laughs> There's how many species of beetles live in there? Right? How many species of birds live in there? You can't see any of that from a satellite, right? So the question to your to your question, right, is you know what's okay, great for geo trees for carbon, but for biodiversity, like it's tricky, right? Because you're not actually seeing individual species. So I'm wondering what what is the latest thinking of how do you go from remote sensed data and some field plots to Biodiversity, and, and, and what are we saying about biodiversity? Is it species richness, what, 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 what have you? Looks like we have an answer here. Uh, well, uh, you're right. We will not see the individual, uh, uh, individual species from space. What we see is their habitat, their environment, and we can see uh, if this environment is changing. We can see if there's uh, droughts which are uh, uh, disturbing uh, this environment. We can see if there are human activities who are uh, intruding into uh, uh, the environment. And uh, if suddenly a uh, pristine uh, forest becomes an uh, oil palm plantation, that's, yeah. these are the things we can see. We can see Ill illegal logging. There are a lot of uh, uh, activities related to near real time uh, monitoring of forest disturbances to enable uh, uh, governments to act if there's uh, an illegal activity on. Related to bio, uh, biodiversity, conserving a pristine forest will conserve the biodiversity inside. Related to a carbon market, 
I see today the variety of how much is paid for a ton of carbon, from a couple of dollars or euro to hundreds of dollars of euro. And this is as well how these are created. I see a future in bringing biodiversity and carbon uh, together to have something like a quali qualified carbon credit, a biodiversity stamp on a carbon credit, which makes as well for uh, uh, investors saying, I'm buying this more expensive one because this is not just guaranteeing me a couple of tons of carbon. This is guaranteeing me as well that the habitat is protected and the biodiversity is respected. Yeah, I, I'd like to just, there's some interest, it's clearly it's some very, to Craig's question, you know, there's some really interesting technology developed and in development with multi and hyperspectral satellite uh, images that are providing extraordinary resolution on canopy diversity. So that's not obviously the diversity living inside the forest. But another way to think about these geotree sites is sort of like sentinel sites that, that once you start to build up this carbon and, and structural and biophysical data for these sites, there's a huge incentive created, I think, for, for creating the biodiversity la layers in, in each of those sites. And then they become in themselves a, a benchmark against which, which we can monitor change, which we can detect change. I mean, when you think of technology like eDNA, acoustic monitoring, and then linking that to the health of the forest, linking that then to the satellite data, I think there's real potential here to use these geotree sites as much more than just thinking about trees. We're thinking about an ecosystem here, and, and we, have the, we have the places to actually broaden and deepen this work. I just want to add a challenge and also an opportunity here. Uh, modeling carbon across space like Stuart uh, mention where you get the environmental variables and you model carbon is one thing. Modeling biodiversity across space is another thing. To do it properly, you need many more points. So then it's uh, the opportunity to then expand geotrees for like broader, more, more sites because that's where we need to if we want to model biodiversity. Bio geotrees. <laughs> so there we go. <laughs> all right, thank you all so much. Thank you so much to our panelists. This was really amazing. This is such exciting work. Thank you all for partnering with the Smithsonian on this, and I can't wait to see where we're going to go. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.